All of us have a past, and that's just what it is. It is our past. There's not really that much we can do about our past, except recognize that we had one. All of us are given today, and there's a whole lot we can do about our today. We don't know if tomorrow will happen, but we all know that there's a future just beyond, and in our future, we will be somewhere forever. So in our today, we want to do something about our future. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Andy Stanley told a story about, about a teacher of six-year-old Sunday school class. And asked them several questions. If, if I clean my room and am nice to my mom and dad, and if I do all my homework, will I go to heaven? And the class answered back, no. He said, if I'm nice to my brothers and sisters, and I'm nice to my neighbors, will I go to heaven? And the class answered back, no. He said, if I'm nice to all the little old ladies and all the pets and animals around, will I go to heaven? No. He said, how do I get to heaven? Kid stood up and said, you got to be dead. And that's pretty much the truth. You got to be dead. And you know what the amazing thing about it is? All of us today are living in our today. Some people try to look in their past and fish in their past and draw from their past and go back to their past. But the past is just that. You can really do very little about your past. But one thing you can do about your past is acknowledge there is a God and that he loves you. And that he sent his Christ, the Messiah, our Lord, his son, to us, who died on the cross, rose from the dead, and can do something about forgiveness of our sins. Confucius, Buddha, Muhammad, they all have philosophies and theories about how you're supposed to live your life. But at the end of the day, all of them died. Only Jesus died and rose from the dead. And he stands tall and says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though dead, shall live. And whoever dies is going to live forever if they trust in me. Paraphrasing. You and I have the wonderful privilege of experiencing eternal life. I'm talking to you in a message series here that's kind of short, about a three-parter. We're talking about vision. And today I want us to go back to the foundation of it all, which is our faith and our recognition of Christ as a Messiah. Jesus as our Lord. Billy Graham's daughter, Ann Graham Lotz, was asked a question after a national catastrophe, and the question was this. Did all those people that died in that accident go to heaven? I thought she gave a rather uh, good answer. She says, you know, my dad is a pretty popular world figure. Everybody knows my dad around the world, so to speak. And sometimes people will drive up to my father's place, and they will come up to the gate And when they get to the gate, they press the button, and they'll say who they are, and they'll say, I want to see you. And he will say, well, I don't know you. You didn't have any arrangements to see me. I don't know who you are. And he won't let them in. She said differently now, when I pull up to the gate in my car, and I push the button, and I say, Dad, it's Ann, your daughter. He says, oh, yeah, press the button, opens the gate, and said, I get to go right on in, and we have a good time. She said, it's something like that when you die. So I want to ask this question again. Can you do anything about your past? Really not that much. Can you do anything about today? Yep, a whole lot. Are you guaranteed tomorrow? Nope. Can you determine where you go for eternity? Yes. So I want to ask you a question that would be this. One minute after you die, where will you be? One minute after your today, where will you be? And the good news is, all of us get to choose where we're going to go. Nobody makes that choice for you. I can't. Your spouse cannot. Your parents can't. Your grandparents can't. Siblings cannot. Nobody can make that choice for you. Everybody has to choose what they will do with Jesus. So when we come to God, he wants us to do several things. A lot of people like to do things and earn their salvation. You really can't earn your salvation. 
But God wants us to do several things. And the first thing God wants us to do, he wants us to understand that we are to give your sin to God and receive a redeemed heart. Give your sin to God and receive a redeemed heart. Now the passage that we read responsibly just a little bit ago really sums up where we are and what we need to know when we're living our today. The scripture says in Romans chapter 3 verse 10, as we look at this path that leads us to salvation, to forgiveness, we look at this path that leads us to a right relationship with God, it says this, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. Man, that's not real flattering, is it? It tells us that the whole playing field is level and that all of us are not righteous. It continues in verse 23 of chapter 3 of Romans and it says this, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. When you look at that word sin, throughout the scripture it means a different thing here and there, but it all is talking about breaking fellowship with God. And ultimately we would understand it to mean a missing of the mark. Just think for a minute, if we had a bow and arrow and we were shooting at a target. If we miss the target, that's what it is talking about. We have missed the target and we have really intended to hit the target, but we miss the target. That is what he's talking about, a sin. We intend to do good, but we intend to follow Christ, but we want, want to live a righteous life, but... So Romans 5 and 8 said it this way, but God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for us. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 puts it this way, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Voila! He's just introduced us to Christ. He's moved past the badness of our broken past to the awareness of our present day reality and says, now I can answer this question over here and I can help you understand what you need to know about eternal life. It is through Jesus Christ. Aha! The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So if he's going to give us a free gift, what's going to happen with that free gift? Well, he continues on, Romans 10, verse 9 and 10. If you confess with your mouth, what are we going to confess? Jesus is Lord. Not Confucius, not Buddha, not Muhammad, not any ideologies, not any kind of philosophy, and not our works righteousness. One fellow said to me one time, he said, well, when I get to heaven, he said, I think I've done enough good stuff. St. Peter said, oh, yeah, come on in. Heaven is not a good old boy place. If it were, why would Christ have died? He takes sin seriously. He died for a reason. We have sinned and fallen short. We read it. So if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is the Lord, and he says, believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you confess, and you are saved. And millions around the world throughout the test of time, and today included, have chosen to follow Jesus Christ. A number of years ago, I was taking a class, and it was a class on evangelism. And that's about sharing the faith. And it was a meaningful class. And while taking that, the professor shared a story. And I hadn't heard it, but boy, I was riveted by it. He told the story of a young boy who had been out swimming and he, he nearly drowned. As a matter of fact, while he was drowning, there was a strapping young man that came running over and picked him up out of the water, rescued him, clear, cleared him out, got him all situated and saved him from drowning. They went on their separate ways, not really intersecting much with each other. But as they had grown on in life... The young kid becomes a young adult, and he made some bad choices. And now, he's looking at his life, he's saying, well, I don't really like the way I'm turning out. I don't want to continue to go this way. But he's in trouble with the law. So what's he to do? Well, he had to go stand before the judge because he had broken the law. And while he's standing there, he looks up at the bench, and he sees the guy sitting there, and he thinks, man, he looks kind of familiar. And then he hears him talk and he says, wow, that voice sounds familiar. And when it came his turn to talk, he realized and he said, your honor. He said, you remember a few years ago, you saved a young boy from drowning. And the judge says, yes, I remember that. And the uh, criminal guy standing there said, well, you saved me then. You can save me now. And the judge says, I was your savior then. I am your judge now, today Christ is our Savior. Over here, He's our judge. What will you do with Jesus? Well, the invitation of the scripture that we just read is give 
your sin to God and he'll redeem your heart. Now, our culture likes to recycle. We recycle everything. We recycle so much. Many of you recycle. You save things and put it out to recycle. But there's one thing I don't know anyone is wanting and nobody is recycling. And you know what it is? It's our sin. Not one person I know wants us to offload our sin to them. Nobody has a recycle bin for sin except God. Through Christ, he invites us to come to him and to cast all of our sin on him. He invites you to that. There's a second thing God wants us to do, and that's this. Give God yourself and receive a righteous heart. Give God yourself and receive a righteous heart. The Apostle Paul, writing in Romans, continued on chapter 6, verse 19 through 21, he talks about being a slave to a master. And he gives that word picture. And the culture then understood it. We understand it now. He said he was a slave to sin. And he didn't want to be that. Chapter 7, verse 14 through 20, he talks about a wrestling match. Have you ever seen the uh, cartoon that an artist will render of a person? They've got a devil on one shoulder and they've got an angel sitting on the other. And you ever heard somebody say, well, the devil made me do it? You know, like the devil speaking in your ear and no, the angel saying do good. Well, Paul was having this wrestling match within himself and he's saying, man, oh me, I don't like this. I don't want to go this way. And so he's wrestling with this whole idea of whether he really surrenders himself to God or not. You see, a lot of us like the idea of giving God our sin, but we wrestle with the idea pretty big time about giving him ourself because we have all of these kingdoms in our own mind that we want to achieve and we want to be Lord in those areas. And we want to run a show in those areas. And we want to do it our way. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. I asked Michelangelo one time, says, how do you come up with such incredible sculpting? And they've asked sculptors through the years, how do you do that? You take this big, stone and then all of a sudden we see this great statue and it's something that people will drive or fly or travel to see from around the world and one sculptor responded this way he said well what I do is cut away everything that doesn't look like the image I'm trying to make and that is exactly why Christ pulls things out of our life he helps us offload some stuff that we don't need some bad behavior Maybe some bad thoughts, maybe some bad habits, maybe some bad language. I don't know. What it is in you may be different than what it is in the neighbor sitting beside you. But Paul continued on in chapter 8, verses 9 through 13, where he found liberty from his sin through daily surrender to God. He's still a human being, and it's still possible for him to shoot the arrow, so to speak, and miss the target. Yes, because he's a human being, but it's possible for him to have right intent now. And he wants to have that right intention. And really what he's looking for here is a sanctification of heart and mind, and body, and spirit, and soul, to where he says, I'm set apart for you, God. I didn't just give you my sin and ask you to be my Savior, but I give you myself, and I ask you to be my Lord. That's what I want you to do in my life. Now, I'm not a great cook. I can grill a little. I can make toast pretty well, and I boil some eggs that have tasted all right, and that's been kind of good. But you probably wouldn't want to come over if I was cooking. If Pam's cooking, on the other hand, you probably would enjoy that quite a bit. A lot of people enjoy getting fed up at our table with her cooking. It's good. And, but if I, if I was here and uh, I, had, I had five eggs and I cracked the first one and put it in a pan and I cracked the second and put it in a pan and I cracked a third and put it in a pan and I tell you I'm going to build you an omelet and I crack that, crack that fourth one open and put it in a pan. You can just smell it and you're getting hungry. Man, it's starting to get good up in here. And you're thinking this is real good. And then I get that fifth one and I crack it and it stinks a little bit. And I'm thinking, ah, maybe this isn't so good and it kind of really smells. And I'm thinking, but I need that fifth one. So I just go ahead and put it in there. That's kind of like our effort to get righteous. We get close, but no cigar. We get close, but we don't get it done. We're not having it all the way. You see. It's not our righteous effort. We're clothed in His righteousness and justified before God through Christ just as if we had never sinned. It's powerful. 
So I want to point a third thought to you. Give God your service and receive a ready heart. Now, I'm going to say something to you. It's going to make some of you just about sick and some of the rest of you are going to say, I agree with that. But I firmly believe God has a purpose for every one of us. I firmly believe it. You say, oh, Kev, well, let's think about it just for a second. I don't necessarily believe God is going to give all of us a great big house, big bank account, really cool cars, or whatever you think is cool. I'm not sure he's going to give all of those things to us exactly as we think maybe we ought to have them. So I'm not sure that's going to, I don't think that's what he means when he says that he has a purpose and a plan. I don't think that's what he means. What he means is, I designed you in your mom's womb, and I have a purpose and a plan for your life. And what I want you to do is surrender yourself to me, and I'll help you fulfill that plan. And in that, because your heart is desiring me, you will get the desires of your heart, because I'm going to give you the things you need, good things, that you, and maybe not stuff, but just satisfied spirit, you know, clear conscience. I'm going to give you some stuff. I'm going to give you favor and blessing. It's amazing what God can choose to give to us. I believe God has a purpose. Here's something else I want to share with you that I think is important to say. As we're young people, and all of us are young at some point in our life, when we're young people, we kind of look out into our life and we say, I've got a whole future ahead of me. I've got a lot of life to live, right? And we get excited thinking about it. Man, I've got all these things that are going to happen to me in my future. And voila, voila. It's really exciting. So we kind of get excited about it, right? We should, because good things are ahead. And um, even though we're not promised any days ahead of us, we're, we're just glad, to be, you know, man, it's, we've got life. But something happens to us as we live a few years, and then we kind of hit those middle years, and then we hit some of those other years where we start hitting something beyond just the middle, and we start realizing it, we start saying, wait a minute, wait, 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 time out. I'm not sure I like this. I'm not sure I signed up for this. I'm not sure I really want this. And what ends up happening to us is we kind of just, we kind of just put our game back in the box and we're kind of like just existing and living our life without any vision, with no goals, and no real purpose for living. I believe God has a purpose for our life even today, even right now. Whatever age you find yourself, I believe God has a purpose for your living right now. If he was ready for you to be in heaven, you would be there. If he needed you there, you would be there. If he wanted you there now, you would be there. You haven't gotten a call because he doesn't want you there now. You're still here because he needs you here. He wants you here. I don't know exactly the reasons why. I don't know exactly what his goal and plan is for you right now in your life. I'm not sure. While I passed it over in Bethlehem a number of years back, had a wonderful privilege of visiting a lot of different people, and I got to go into a number of nursing homes. And so I would go down to Quakertown. Well, it was quite a drive over there, and I enjoyed the drive, and I would go down to Quakertown to a nursing home. I can take you there, but I don't remember the name of the nursing home. So it's, you know, you go up by the Dairy Queen light, I remember that, and then you turn left, you know, you go down a few blocks, and then you turn right, and you go down about a mile. There was a lady named Esther Lobb. Do you remember her name? Esther Lobb. She was over there. Well, Esther was a wonderful lady. She was up in her 90s. Her sister had just died. And she was kind of like, I don't know what, what I have. You know, I don't know what's going to happen here. But she was a resilient soul. I mean, to live 90 years, you know, you've got to have something in you. And so she dug deep and I'd go down to see her. And you know what was amazing to me? She started telling me stories about herself. And she'd say, Pastor, have I told you what I did? Look at that ribbon over there on the calendar. And she'd have one of these big calendars with the big numbers on it and picture on it. She'd have a blue ribbon on it. She said, yeah, I won the wheelchair race last week. And she was excited about it. And she, yeah, we had a bowling tournament. And, uh, she won the bowling tournament, and it was awesome, really cool. She was excited. And then she'd go for some of the deeper stuff. She said, you know what I'm doing now? I'd visit her every month. She said, you know what I'm doing now? I said, what are you doing, Esther? What are you, what's happening? What are you excited about? She says, well, I go in the room and I visit a lot of these old people. <laughs> I thought, yes, you do. She says, and I sit with them while they die. I said, what? She said, I sit with them while they die because they don't have family with them. And the nurses can't be in a room all the time. And she led a number of them to Jesus on her deathbed. It's powerful stuff. And here's the thing. 
I think God has a purpose for you. I don't know what it is. I think he cares about you right now. And you say, Kev, that sounds good. And you've told us a couple of nice stories. But let's go to the scripture and let's see what it says. Well, a lot of us have somewhere in our mind, if not on a wall somewhere, maybe on your computer screen, on your phone somewhere, it's walled up. Jeremiah 29, 11, you know it, right? For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. But what about Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10? Do you know that? You were created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for you to do. Are you kidding me? He has you here today on purpose, on a mission from God. Anybody ask you what you're doing? I'm on a mission. Oh, you are? Yeah, I'm on a mission from God. Are you kidding me? No, I'm on a mission. I don't know what it is, but I know he's going to open the door, and I'm on that mission from God. This is powerful Works he's given us in advance to do. We're getting ready to head into a new decade. It's almost 2020 now. You know that, right? We want 2020 vision. We want to be able to look into the future and say, yes, there's a reason for me to live. And if God lets us live through that next decade, guess what? As individuals and then as people of God, we want to be able to achieve what he has in mind for us to achieve. Psalm 139, verse 16. Get a load of this. You, speaking to God, you saw me before I was born and scheduled each day of my life, before I began to breathe. I was mowing my yard yesterday, and I pray when I mow, and I think when I mow, and I plan when I mow, and most of the time, I use it as productive time, because I'm, it's just, you know, I'm just mowing the grass, so I'm thinking about stuff and praying for people who have asked me to pray for them. Well, I started praying for our unborn grandson. And I'm thinking, my goodness, he is formed. And, and my phone's sitting down there, but my daughter sends us every Sunday morning a little thing. And some of you have had babies recently. You probably did this too. Uh, you know, the baby's a, the size of a, what was that little instrument? Uh, yeah, about the size of a chihuahua. Now, and a, no, no, it was a, no, it was one of those other things. A ukulele, yeah. It was a uke. And about the size of a uke. And I was thinking as I was riding across that yard, it's amazing to me all the parts are going to be with this kid when it's arrived. Its package is fully assembled. And I was thinking, my stars, God, be with this child all the days of his life. Let him amount to something for you. Let him be a difference maker for you. Let this kid really come into the world that is so crazy and chaotic knowing that there's a God and knowing that you've sent a Christ and knowing the power of your Holy Spirit to help him live a life of meaning and significance in this world. Let him be able to change the world in which he lives. Then here we go back to us when we get older. Every day was recorded in your book. That's the day when you get diagnosed with something. That's the day whenever you have an accident. That's the day whenever you can't sleep well. Every day. That's the day when you celebrate another birthday. That's the day when you're old. Whatever old is, that's that day. Rick Warren, in one of his writings, The Purpose of Christmas, he put down something that I really took up and, and really liked and found it to be helpful. He said, people live at one of three levels you probably live at one of these levels. There's a survival mode, and that is where people of the world make one to two dollars a day. They're not really, you know, doing much more than just surviving, getting by, just enough food to be able to live. Then there is an area where the United States tends to live, and that would be what we would call, and, and all the developed countries would be kind of a success level. And in the success level, we would understand that living there, uh, we tend to have all of these successes around us in our mind that prop us up. Like, if I'm educated in the right place, or if I've, if I've achieved the right number in the bank account, or if I drive the right this, or if I wear the right that, or live in the right the other, if I belong to this club or that club, if I do this activity for leisure, then I'm pretty cool. We kind of have the success club. But let me tell you something that I think is very fascinating and quite interesting. I've won a few awards. I haven't won that many, but a few. And I know something about them. And this will be true about yours. When I come to the end of my life, my kids will box those things up and put them in a dumpster. Can I get a witness in the house? Because they mean absolutely nothing to them. Nothing. All the certificates, all of the anything, awards, degrees, anything that I can name, all of this stuff. Even this building will be old if I live long enough. And if you say, yeah, I was here when we built this, so it'll be old news to them then.
We live at such a success level that we miss the important because that's the next level. That's a level of significance. That's legacy level. That's significance. That's investing in something that is bigger than yourself. That's establishing currency in heaven. Jesus says, lay up treasures in heaven where thieves can't get in, where decay can't take care of it. He says, lay treasure up there. We'll use an example. When we ask you to buy a chair, as a for instance, we're saying a chair costs $75. And so when you buy a chair, just think about this. You're thinking, well, that's a chair. Can you find one cheaper? Well, let's think about it. And then you go over all the dynamics of that chair, and it's a wide load because some people might need a wide load chair, and it's got the lumbar in the back because, of, you know, it's more comfortable. And so they're lightweight, only 17 pounds instead of the 23 or 4, so you can have anybody stack. I mean, you just see of all the things. No, 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 no. That's temporal. That's the success level. We found the best chair. What's the significance level? Okay, let's go to the significant level. Here's the significant level. When you give something like that for the chair, let's say, as a for instance, and it's not all about money, but I'm just using this as an example. When you do that, what you're doing is you're giving it to a chair where someone's going to sit in a worship service and maybe hear the gospel for the first time. You're giving towards something. Someone may sit here in a wedding. Someone may sit here in a funeral. Someone may sit here and... and be part of a concert. Someone may be here for a candlelight service or for, for an a Easter service. Someone may be here on any old random day of the week and come in and they may find Jesus sitting right there in that chair. Then what I have done is not gathered more temporal stuff and not just had one more temporal success. That chair has become a spiritual object in this sense that I have given it in the name of Jesus and now what's happened is I am investing in eternity because I know the soul is going to sit in there. It's going to live somewhere forever and I'm leveraging that as they sit in that chair, they're going to be going toward Christ. This is why we show Christ in our attitude. We show Christ in our kindness. We show Christ in our employment. We show Christ in our neighborhood. We show Christ in our athlete, athletic situation. We show Christ everywhere we are. And in our relationship with our spouse and with our children and with our parents, we show Christ. Why? Because he has changed us in our today. And it's impacting as we leverage for our tomorrow. And one day, we're going to come into the heaven with him. This is powerful stuff. But some people hang back here and look at this and they say, oh, Kev, Kev, what I've done. Get over yourself. You're not that big a deal. I said it. I meant it. Respectfully. Respectfully. He has already paid the price. Cash in. Cash in. And let him forgive you and cleanse you. But I don't know if he can do it for me. Don't make it about you. Trust him. He died for everyone. And put your ego on the altar and let him forgive you too. In Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26, it says this. I love this. God talking. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you a heart of stone. That represents all the gunk of the past. And I will give you, present tense, a heart of flesh. In other words, a heart that is living and vibrant in me. And that's how you are born again. I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you a question. I can't answer, but you can and my question is three parts. Do you have a redeemed heart? Do you have a righteous heart? Do you have a ready heart? God, I give you my service because I have a ready heart. Count me in. Here I go. I'm going to make a difference. 